Hello, and welcome to the CAP Today webinar for Thursday, October 5th. I'm Bob McGonigal, the publisher of CAP Today, and I'll be your host and moderate a question and answer session after our formal presentations. Today's webinar is entitled, Post-Transplant Viral Infections, Challenges with Clinical Management. Now this important topic and webinar is made possible through a special educational grant from Roche. We want to acknowledge Roche and thank them for their support of this important program today. Our distinguished speakers, and I'll say more about each one in due course, are Dr. Elena Beam, who is Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic, and Dr. Joseph Yao, who is a consultant to the Division of Clinical Microbiology, also at the Mayo Clinic. We also have a special guest, Rochelle, who I will introduce shortly. But before we get underway, I want to share a few housekeeping tips. First, you, we often recommend that you go ahead and refresh your browser. You'll see at the lower right-hand corner of your web page there, a uh, number toll-free, 858-345-5916. Should you have any technical problem at any time during today's webinar, either with audio or dis display of the website, you can call that number. We have live help ready to help you and aid you. In addition, you see the Q&A box, which is there. That's, of course, for your questions and comments for our speakers, but indeed, uh, you can also put in technical issues there, and they'll be quickly resolved. I want to remind you that the full slides and audio will be available in about a week at captodayonline.com for your review and for sharing with colleagues who couldn't be with you today. I want you to know as well that you'll receive some follow-up uh, email from us and Roche, perhaps, as well, so you sh should know that. Uh, finally, let me remind you that CAP Today does not endorse any products or services that may be mentioned today. Furthermore, any comments of mine are purely personal and not to be taken as policy of the CAP Today or the College of American Pathologists. And with that, we'll get underway. And as uh, often is the case, I have a very special guest who's joining us today. He is Dr. Amit Parulakar. He's an MBA and an MD, and he's the Director of Global Medical Affairs for Roche in Infection and Immunity. He's a highly trained pulmonary physician in critical care and transplant, and uh, he's going to share a few introductory slides uh, that will help set some context for today, and I will ask Amit to begin. Thanks, Bob. Um, uh, certainly on behalf of uh, Roche, uh, I'd like to thank the attendees uh, for attending what I think will be a really informative uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Beam and Dr. Yao. Uh, I'll just give a little bit of background on uh, Roche's commitment to transplant diagnostics. Um, we know that transplant volumes have continued to grow worldwide over the past decade leading into the pandemic. Uh, and with a slight dip uh, occurring through the pandemic, uh, volumes are projected to continue to rise. Uh, and we also know that transplant patients are at increased risk for all types of infections, uh, including viral infections due to uh, the immunosuppressive therapy associated with their transplants. CMV, EBV, and BK virus are some of the most common viruses that we see after transplant. And depending on the virus, they have significant direct effects um, in terms of disease, but also indirect effects on things like allograft dysfunction, acute and chronic rejection, and potentially morbidity and mortality. When we think about post-transplant viral load monitoring or appropriate solutions, we're looking for uh, accurate reproducible tests. And ideally, these tests will be able to detect virus or DNAemia in patients prior to the development of clinical symptoms, or at least prior to the development of severe disease. 
So we're looking for quantitative PCR tests that can help us detect virus early, but we're also looking for tests that can monitor patients uh, that have already have detected virus, so looking for increases in viral load or decreases in viral load for patients on treatment. One of the bigger challenges in transplantation, especially depending on the frequency of the organ transplanted, is the geographic footprint of the United States. And many of our transplant patients travel long distances uh, to uh, their transplant centers. And that makes post-transplant viral monitoring challenging because we know that different assays for specific tests like CMV, EBV, and BK cannot necessarily be compared. So one of the major advantages of commercial standardized assay solutions such, are, such as ours is the ability to compare tests from different sites, um, which may add increased convenience for uh, patients that already suffer significant amounts of inconvenience related to transplantation and the travel that it, that it uh, causes. These are really our three post-transplant viral monitoring solutions, the COBOS CMV, EBV, and BK virus tests. Uh, for running on our X800 platform. Uh, they're quantitative PCR assays that are approved for use in plasma. The COBUS BKV assay can also be used in uh, urine stabilized in COBUS PCR media. As you can see, the EBV and BK assays are dual target assays, uh, very uh, sensitive uh, assays with low limits of detection across the board and robust linear ranges. Um, Additionally, in patients where it may be indicated, they have the ability to run all three assays off a single patient sample with under one milliliter uh, of sample. Um, these tests are highly specific and inclusive for the relevant genotypes and subtypes. And so uh, in terms of what we feel is the clinical value of this portfolio is the ability to offer three FDA approved quantitative PCR tests for post-transplant viral monitoring. Um, that allow for better comparison of results across different hospitals and labs. And with that, uh, I won't take up any more time, and I'll turn it back over to, to Bob for the main presentation. Dr. Pellicar, thank you so much. That was a great introduction uh, to an important standard industry offering uh, to deal with these very important infectious viruses that arise in the context of transplantation. Thank you very much for that presentation. And now we'll go on uh, to our two principal speakers. As I said, I wanted to say a little bit more about them. Our first speaker today will be Elena Beam. Uh, Dr. Beam is an assistant professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. She's a program director of transplant ID fellowship She's also the fellowship uh, program uh, associate director for the infectious diseases. She's eminently qualified to speak on this subject. And uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Yao, who will follow her uh, briefly, and then she'll return to run the final leg of the webinar today. Uh, Dr. Joseph Yao is at the Mayo Clinic in the Division of Clinical Microbiology in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, famously there, where he has the title as a consultant. Uh, having made that introduction, and uh, we'll get underway. Remember any questions or comments that you wish to make and be made by typing into the Q&A box. And with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Beam to go ahead and begin her presentation. Dr. Bean. Thank you for that warm introduction, and I am very happy to share um, the clinical perspective of these important post-transplant viral infections and the challenges with their management to date. Um, some of the learning objectives uh, we have in mind for this presentation is uh, first to identify some con common clinical symptoms and risk factors for these viral infections post-transplant, recognize the importance of standardized viral load testing for them, as well as review updated prevention strategies and, and uh, dive into treatment and mon monitoring for CMV, EBV, and BK viral infections. So before we jump in, I like to uh, focus on uh, the patient perspective. When are we going to be thinking about an increased risk of viral infection after solid organ transplantation? And really immediately in the first month, we really focus on donor-derived infections. But 
after that first month, the high-risk uh, viral infections uh, change to those that are associated with the immunosuppression the patients receive. So the first six months become um, herpes virus-related infections, as well as um, hepatitis virus-related infections. Uh, and of course, uh, respiratory season viruses will uh, be there uh, during the first six months as well as after the first six months. Um, the late viral infection period, typically we consider greater than six months from transplant, uh, is something we're seeing now uh, given the use of prophylaxis in the early post-transplant period. So this is something we keep in mind uh, throughout the patient's transplant journey. Why are we focusing on CMV, EBV, and BK viral infections? Well, they have a couple of similar challenges uh, as it relates to post-transplant time period. First, there's no available vaccine yet for these viral infections. Um, as they present themselves after transplantation, um, they are associated with significant implications in morbidity, some in mortality, as well as potential for allograft loss. And then finally, they have an ability to establish lifelong latency, which is why we continue to worry about them throughout the patient's transplant experience. First, the CMV, uh, commonly referred to as the troll of transplant because of uh, the significance uh, our patients experience when they do uh, have a CMV tissue invasive disease. Um, this is very common post-transplant. CMV has both direct viral effects that uh, could be just from viremia, fever, uh, some abnormalities in the patient's lab test, but also truly invasive disease, which is commonly gastrointestinal infe infection with uh, diarrhea, but it could also affect the organ transplant site itself, such as uh, CMV-related hepatitis, nephritis, pneumonitis. Um, in addition to these direct viral inf uh, effects, there's indirect viral effects. Uh, this viral infection has been commonly linked to rejection of the allograft, as well as long-term graft outcomes in those patients who do experience CMV infection and disease. What are some of the risks that we know of that are established in the CMV arena for solid organ transplantation? Most of them are tied to the overall level of immunosuppression for the patient, such as what induction was used at the time of transplant, and if there was rejection post-transplant that required increased immunosuppression that elevates the CMV risk further. The most important has always been the CMV CR status for the donor and recipient. And here uh, we have um, a box that shows what exactly that means. So highest risk is going, going to be our, what we refer to as the CMV mismatch population, where the donor was positive, however the recipient had a negative serologic testing pre-transplant, that's the highest risk population. If the recipient had previous uh, positive uh, exposure to CMV, they're in the middle ground in terms of risk, and then our lowest risk population is the CMV donor negative, recipient negative population. In and as we look at what, what, how does that play out in our adult transplant population, our heart transplants, about a third of them were the highest risk mismatch status. A little bit over a half were recipient positive, which puts us uh, looking for complications related to CMV in essentially up to 90% of the patients who undergo solid organ transplantation as an adult. Other Risk factors that are important to consider include the type of solid organ transplant. This may be because of a higher severe infection risk. For example, pneumonitis in a lung transplant will typically uh, be a very significant infection associated with morbidity and mortality. Additional uh, risks that are described in the literature include lymphocyte count, with uh, lymphopenia being very common after transplantation, but similarly correlating with subsequent CMV infection risk, as well as T-cell-specific CMV response, which is likely just a marker of the nut state of immunosuppression uh, that the patients have received, as mentioned above. This was uh, first really well qualified uh, almost a decade ago, uh, where uh, patients were uh, reviewed by risk of relapse of infection after prophylaxis completed for CMV disease. And here we can see a significant difference in uh, uh, freedom from CMV disease in those who had a positive or a negative result. Uh, really, the patients with uh, uh, testing that was indeterminate, likely due to uh, their overall highly immunosuppressed state, were the most at risk for CMV-related complications, again, highlighting that it's the immunosuppressive status of these patients that drives uh, risk after prophylaxis. 
Second virus I'm going to introduce the clinical perspective of is Epstein virus virus. As we've discussed, EBV is a commonly uh, feared uh, virus post transplant. Uh, really driven by the concern of uh, a complication referred to as post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, or PTLD. How we believe this occurs is that uh, once EBV establishes latency, the EBV-positive B-cell proliferation can occur without uh, a check uh, due to the immunosuppression and decreased T-cell immune surveillance. The most uh, concerning period for our patients is the first two years, uh, and that's where we focus on uh, monitoring for viral replication. And uh, outside of laboratory monitoring, if a positive test result um, for EBV is noted, we review if the patient has experienced a post transplant lymphoproliferative disease uh, by, by patient symptoms, as well as scanning, typically CT scan, PET scan, uh, or potential biopsy need uh, for diagnosis. This is the most common malignancy in this, per, in this early uh, SO, post SOT period, and therefore it has high significance. Associated risk factors for uh, EBV after SOT are again driven by the serologic status. So the mismatched population is the highest risk, just like in a, our previous virus with CMB. However, you can see this is um, really isolated uh, high risk population, whereas the recipient positive um, population has a much lower risk. So here our focus is really on the mismatched population. EBV seroprevalence in adults uh, is really significant, so the likelihood of a positive uh, recipient uh, and donor is high in our adult population. However, um, uh, then the focus turns to the CMV mismatch status, uh, where uh, we follow them much closer for this complication. Additional risks include age, ethnicity, and the, again, the overall degree of immunosuppression. Um, we also see a different rate of EBV-related complications among the different subtle organ transplant types, likely because of the different management from an immunosuppression perspective for each of these, but also uh, the lymphoid load in the organ, and that uh, is why we see the highest uh, complication rate with, due to EBV among our intestinal multi-organ transplants, followed by lungs, a heart and liver somewhere in the moderate risk, and kidney and bone marrow uh, in the lower risk. Risk factors for PTLD, the post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, are different if they occur in the first year or uh, considered early PTLD or late, more than uh, 12 months. Typically, this is much more than 12 months. Uh, so primary B EBV in infection uh, organ type and the younger recipients are what we focus on in the early uh, PTLD diagnosis. If we consider the late uh, PTLD, this is typically going to be the older uh, recipient of the transplant. Uh, there's going to be more EBV negative PTLD presentation as opposed to an EBV driven process, as well as um, just the overall duration of the immunosuppression um, that elevates the risk of PTLD. And the third virus, uh, the clinical uh, pre uh, presentation we uh, focus on is uh, unique. Uh, we, we're going to discuss the BK poliomavirus. Um, this is really uh, one where amongst the solid organ transplant recipients, we focus on our renal transplant recipients as opposed to uh, significant concern for the other transplant recipients. Um, the reason the focus is there is because uh, our uh, lifelong infection, uh, once it's established in uh, our re renal transplant donors or recipients, um, the virus will be uh, then uh, lifelong uh, uh, established in the renal tubular and uroepithelial cells. Uh, after transplantation, uh, with the immunosuppression that comes, uh, we will see a complication uh, due to reactivation of the viral infection. In 1 to 10 percent of these patients can develop uh, the dreaded BK-associated nephropathy, which has significant concern for um, allograft loss. How BK presents itself typically it has a very specific pattern. First, we find viruria, so positive in the urine, then in the blood, viremia, followed by the complication that we are hoping to prevent, specifically nephropathy, which can affect the allograft function um, uh, overall. So the rates of each of these complications uh, is a little bit different. Viruria is much more common, viremia is a little bit less, as, and followed by lower numbers of 
um, polyomer virus associated nephropathy. Again, we worry about this complication because it has a very a significant graft loss association uh, that comes with it. Outside of the kidney transplant, uh, there's uh, known complications from BK as well as in a, in a bone marrow transplant recipient specifically there. It's more of a hemorrhagic cystitis presentation, and other immunocompromised hosts will present much more rare with complications related to BK infection. Here, I'm going to take a pause and uh, send the uh, presentation over to Dr. Yao to uh, talk to us from the laboratory perspective. Dr. Beam, thank you very much. Thank you again to Dr. Beam, reminding you all you can make comments or ask questions at any time. And now it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Yao to begin his presentation. Dr. Yao. Thank you, Dr. McGonigal. <clears throat> Um, here are my conflict of interest disclosure. I received research grants uh, from these two companies <clears throat> and also a um, member of the advisory board for Roche Diagnostics. I'm going to <clears throat> briefly discuss the importance of standardization of uh, calibration of viral load assays, namely the CMV, EBV, and BK virus uh, that <clears throat> Dr. Beam had mentioned earlier. Uh, in this presentation today. I'm also going to share with the audience uh, our laboratory's approach to conversion from previous LDT uh, to standardize uh, FDA-approved viral load assays for these three transplant-associated viruses. So let's look at <clears throat> why do we need to standardize assays for viral load testing. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Pang, and colleagues uh, more than 10 years ago surveyed 35 clinical laboratories with uh, 10 panels of CMV uh, DNA material and look at the variability of results. On the left-hand side, you can see that for these three separate <clears throat> unique specimens, ranging from 600 copies per ml to 9,500 copies per ml, um, there's a quite a large spread. These are log copies per ml. So these were before the WHO had international units for CMV. So each lab, uh, each lab were, uh, was reporting their results in copies per ml. Each color or box represent one clinical laboratory. So there are 35 laboratories. So at the low end of quantification at 600 copies per ml, we have almost 14 labs who could not actually detect this virus, whereas the remaining uh, 21 report results anywhere from 1.6 logs to 4.5 logs. So this is almost a three log spread of this single specimen tested across 24 labs. Similarly, for 7,500 and 9,500 copies per ml for the expected results, we see a similar spread although less spread than the lower end of the quantification range. Overall, when they looked at 10 unique samples that were sent to these 35 labs, we see two things. Um, we see quite a bit of spread. The vertical height of these dots represent the variability or spread of the results. And you can see that for this particular sample, CMV8, the spread is from minus three logs to 1.5 logs, so almost a 4.5 log spread. The second thing we see also is that the commercially available assay represented uh, by the word COM uh, in either uh, orange color or the purple color, the spread is actually less than the laboratory developed quantification assays. And this is true for all 10 specimens. So it's no wonder uh, patients um, have difficulty uh, determining, or clinicians determining, what are the exact correct viral load for CMV among their post-transplant uh, patients. Um, similar studies uh, almost <clears throat> 10 years ago now have also found this to the same for EBV. So here we have an EBV commercial uh, reference material uh, tested by five different assays at five different laboratories. 
and you can see that the spread is um, as wide as almost two log, and that's a hundredfold uh, for these five different um, <clears throat> assays. And even when we use international standards, by now we have WHO international standards available. For these five specimens tested by five different laboratories, we still see almost a two log spread um, of these uh, five different assays. So that brings us to the question of what reference materials should be used uh, for standardization and comparing assays for agreement. Here's a study uh, by Angie Caliando uh, back in 2009 who uses clinical specimens as well as two different commercially available CMB panels, the OptiQuant and the OptiQuant IC. Um, you can see that the clinical specimens represented by the open triangles have a pretty wide spread. Um, each dot represents one clinical sample. Now the OptiQuant <clears throat> regular panel represented by the black circles um, are pretty tight in terms of variability. Um, but the OptiQuant uh, panel that's represented by the square gray boxes have quite a, a widespread uh, among the reference ranges. So I wanted to define commutability. Commutability is really ability of a reference or control material for measurement of a given analyte to have interassay properties that's comparable to the properties of the authentic clinical samples, such as serum or plasma, when tested by more than one assay. So the material is considered commutable when an assay produces the same result for this material as it does for an authentic patient sample that contains the same analyte. And so this is important to use uh, commutable, commutable uh, reference material to calibrate assays because assays calibrated with such commutable material will produce results for clinical samples that are equivalent among all such assays, regardless of manufacturers or assay design. <clears throat> now, um, as of today, we have WHO international standards for these transplant-associated viruses. There are six of these. We have, for a long time, over 10 years, um, viral hepatitis HIV international standards for B, C, D, E, and HIV 1 and 2. But having WHO international standards doesn't mean that clinical laboratories <laughs> will adopt them. Uh, this is the July 2023 CAP VLS-B viral load proficiency test survey. Uh, I looked at the results and compiled this table. And you can see that for CMV, Almost all the, all the participants, 304 of them, have switched over to using international units per ml, um, whether they are IVD assays or LDT users. For EBV, it's about 71% that have gone over to calibrate their assays to international standards. Uh, still quite a few, almost a third, are still reporting results in copies per ml and not calibrated to the WHO international standards. For BK, the percentage of converting to using international units is still only about 55% versus those who are continued to report results in copies per ml. Now, for those laboratories performing HHV6, none of them actually have calibrated their assays to WHO international units. There are 46 of these and they are still reporting results in copies per ml. Now, having an international standards for analyte doesn't mean that the assays are interchangeable. This was a nice study uh, performed by Dr. Brasitis and her colleagues uh, almost six years ago that showed these uh, nine uh, commercially available assays. Some of them are LDT. Some of them are uh, FDA-approved tests. Uh, show that there's quite a spread of the results um, <clears throat> for these uh, WHO international standards. And you can see that this last one, uh, which is actually the previous Roche FDA approved assays, um, has quite a big spread and underquantified compared to other uh, 
commercially available assays. And the conclusion from this study uh, indicates that the assay uh, primer design is very important. Uh, so the conclusion of this study indicates that <clears throat> the viral load uh, results among different assays depend on the assay designs, namely the amplicon length that is amplified by the primers in the assay, as well as the natural state of the virus of interest in the human matrix, which is in this case for CMV is the plasma. So for the <clears throat> CMV, it exists in uh, variable length in the human plasma. So it's highly fragmented. Um, and so if the assay is designed to amplify a short amplicon, it will <clears throat> tend to uh, detect as many fragments as possible present in a given unit volume of the plasma. Whereas an assay that has a large amplicon, such as this assay in the end, uh, the likelihood of amplifying a large amplicon in a highly fragmented, fragmented virus in the plasma is much less. So it has a tendency to under-quantify compared to a small amplicon assay. So assay design as well as natural state of the virus of interest in the human matrix are equally important. So um, back in 2012, when we move from the CMV um, lab developed tests using a light cycle quantification assay uh, to the FDA approved uh, CMV uh, COBOS AmpliPrep COBOS TACMAN assay on the Roche system, uh, we <clears throat> had communications with our transplant clinician service, service and to let them know about the differences between our then LDT versus the uh, CMV IVD. We shared with the transplant service team that the results correlations are not that good because we're converting from an LDT uh, in copies per ml to IU per ml. And you can see that the coefficient correlation uh, is less than 0.95, and the coefficient of determination is less than 0 0.9. And when we convert copies to copies, um, these did not change uh, or improve the correlations. And when we did the bland altman uh, difference plot, you can see that there's quite a bit of bias, meaning at the higher end, the IBD assay uh, quantifies higher than the LDT. And the spread uh, is almost two and a half log over the quantification range uh, by this an 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 analysis. And we also saw that with the IVD assay, there are results uh, that are now quantifiable, even high, compared to the LDT, which was only able to quantify down to 1,000 copies. So there's quite a bit of uh, differences in the results. So for the clinicians who are monitoring these patients uh, every week, especially for the CMV mismatch uh, transplant recipient, it is important for them to re-baseline these patients during the transition period. So we implemented a 60-day transition period where uh, <clears throat> both the former LDT as well as the new IVD tests uh, was, were performed on every specimen during the 60 days. And then after that 60 days, then only the IVD assay is performed and reporting out results in IU per ML. Uh, we did that the same uh, two years ago in the middle of the pandemic for conversion from our EBV LDT to the Roche Cobos EBV assay that was FDA approved. Um, the EBV LDT that we performed was already calibrated to the WHO international standards. But of course, the sensitivity and quantification range of these two assays are different. Um, and we actually did not see the poor correlations that we saw with CMV converting from LDT to IVD. With EBV from our IU per ml LDT to the IU per ml IVD, the correlations were actually pretty good. Uh, we didn't see much difference, except that there can be differences up to a log or log and a half between the former LDT 
and the new FDA-approved assays. We also uh, found similar correlations for the BK virus in plasma, as you can see in the Deming regression on the left and also in the blend altman So for conversion from the LDT to FDA-approved assays for BK virus and EBV, we did not offer a transition period of dual testing uh, for these specimens. However, we did put in a reporting comment to alert our clinical colleagues uh, for the first 90 days after implementation that the new assay results may show up to one log, which is tenfold uh, higher or lower, depending on which assay, from the previous LDT results. So I'm going to conclude um, by saying that uh, assay calibration and design should use commutable uh, reference or control material that are traceable to the WHO international standards going forward for uh, these transplant virus uh, assay design. And that as much as possible, these quantitative assays should be calibrated to the WHO international standards. And hopefully, these standards uh, are created with commutable uh, material. But, you know, uh, some of these assays. Uh, or WHO standards haven't been studied extensively uh, with different assays that are commercially available or LDT out in clinical labs. What I have shown are EBV, BK, and CMV, uh, WHO international standards, but for adenovirus, HHV6, the commutability of these uh, international standards have not been studied. So it is still important to monitor viral load results uh, in patients uh, for these other viruses where commutability is unknown at this time. I'll stop here and pass on the presentation to Dr. Beam. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll uh, reload our, our uh, slide presentation, our two decks that we're juggling today. What a fine presentation that was, and I'm sure we'll have, and we already do have, Quite a few questions. Let me remind you all, you can make comments, ask questions, et cetera, and we'll get as many of those in as we can as time permits. As we bring back Dr. Beam's slides and presentation. There we are. Thanks, you. Thanks again to Dr. Yao. Dr. Beam, you're back on. Thank you, and a big thank you to Dr. Yar's lab for communicating all of those changes uh, to us on the clinician side uh, as we were made, uh, making adjustments to our patient's care uh, to ensure the transitions are smooth. So how do we use these uh, diagnostic tests uh, for the monitoring uh, and prevention of uh, these infections? For CMV, there are typically two specific approaches uh, that are considered adequate uh, uh, for prevention of uh, infection after solid organ transplantation, referred to as preemptive approach or universal prophylaxis approach. With the universal prophylaxis approach, the patient is given an antiviral medication for a pre-specified period of time. Uh, typically depends on their risks of CMV, longer for the mismatch population, uh, and maybe the shorter duration for the recipient positive population. Uh, and they discontinue uh, the uh, prophylaxis at the de decided upon period of time, and they're monitored, monitored for infection after. On the other hand, preemptive antiviral monitoring requires weekly laboratory checks for CMV PCR, uh, and one, upon a detection of a positive result, the patient is then started on an antiviral medication, typically until two negative uh, PCRs are obtained. The antiviral medication stop, and they continue back on their weekly monitoring, uh, uh, may require restarting an antiviral again if a positive PCR is identified. The duration of preemptive monitoring is typically also standardized according to risk. Um, so this uh, weekly monitoring will continue uh, for that period, uh, typically six months. 
So uh, as we dive into the prophylaxis mon uh, option a little bit more, we now have uh, two agents for the first time in a solid organ transplant that could be utilized. Our tried and true uh, long-term antiviral medication would be Valgan Cyclovir. Um, this is prophylaxis approach is typically what we have been using for the higher risk recipients, uh, whether it be the mismatch uh, or um, increased immunosuppression um, due to induction or reduction uh, population, we may uh, prefer the universal prophylaxis uh, for these types of patients. Um, the prophylaxis would be also then uh, restarted if they were to get rejection therapy, even after their first uh, six months or whatever the high risk uh, time frame was. Um, issues with universal prophylaxis is, of course, um, cost of the drug itself, uh, but also the side effects of the drug, which could be uh, significant. Uh, and for this drug, for Valgan Cyclovir, it's really the cytopenias, like thermocytopenia, uh, leukopenia, that get us uh, into significant um, tolerance issues. Uh, some patients who are uh, considered to have additional risk for CMV after their prophylaxis period, they may undergo a monitoring period uh, uh, with a weekly CMV PCRs for three months uh, if we continue to be significantly concerned about risk of disease. Uh, so jumping to this latermavir option, latermavir was previously approved in 2017 for prevention of CMV in the allogenic uh, bone marrow transplant recipients through, uh, for 100 days. Uh, however, now uh, we have uh, approval for latermavir in the high-risk kidney transplant uh, population, the mismatched kidney transplant status. So this is something that is new and uh, just being introduced in practice uh, across uh, um, the United States for the high risk uh, population. What is uh, different about latermavir? It does not have uh, the dreaded side effect of cytopenias like leukopenia uh, that was seen with Valgan cyclovir. Um, however, there's still um, cost issues and uh, uh, that can be a significant uh, concern. Uh, and the approval was for the kidney transplant high risk population, meaning we don't have that data yet on other solid organ transplant uh, types. Uh, prevention uh, is something that we've discussed, uh, the second option being a preventive monitoring with weekly results. This is where a really solid process for the transplant center is needed. Uh, first, the lab has to be able to perform the test. We have to be able to review the test, reach out to the patient, and start them on antiviral therapy within a reasonable amount of time. So the logistics here is likely um, uh, the challenge. Uh, however, when the logistics uh, are achieved well by the transplant center, this is a very, very nice option because it may uh, allow uh, for a subclinical CMV replication in these lower risk patients that could help uh, develop T, uh, T cell specific immunity. This is uh, how we extrapolate uh, to explain why delayed onset CMV uh, in those who were on the preemptive strategy a year out or longer uh, is less compared to those two who were on prophylaxis where the subclinical CMV replication uh, does not occur. Uh, but this is still extrapolation for now. Um, when CMV infection and disease occurs, our typical treatment options include anti antiviral therapy. Again, oral valgancyclovir or IV gancyclovir is going to be the most commonly used uh, uh, antiviral medication. The dosage is different for treatment dose versus prophylaxis, uh, so that, that would be escalated. Uh, we typically review if there's any room for uh, change in the patient's immunosuppression uh, and a modification of that if possible. Adjunctive measures that have been previously tried, though are not considered proven to be effective, would be uh, CMV-specific immunoglobulin or IVIG. Um, and uh, ongoing monitoring to see if we have response to treatment. Uh, so how does that work? So we continue with weekly CMV-PCR and uh, re develop concern for patients who uh, are non-responding uh, two weeks into their therapy. This is where we start to consider potential resistance um, developing. Uh, similarly, we can look at patient symptoms. And classically, uh, response to treatment uh, before uh, discontinuation of therapy requires two negative consecutive PCR results. This has been questioned recently because as our tests become more and more sensitive, uh, perhaps uh, uh, what was previously considered two negative CME PCR results is taking a lot longer to achieve and may not be clinically necessary. Um, so uh, in a review of CMV management, we know that there is a review of the patient's immunosuppressive uh, regimen and potentially changing uh, that if possible. The antiviral therapy, we've discussed a typical uh, approach with uh, 
non-resistant cases of CME, uh, but uh, other options exist uh, associated with toxicity for truly resistant CME, with, uh, with Foscarnet, Sodafovir uh, being the previously available regimens. New um, uh, and approved in November 2021 is a uh, Maribavir, a new uh, uh, agent available for those who are uh, experiencing CME that's resistant or not responding to standard therapy. Um, this uh, is an exciting uh, uh, avenue for us here in Transplant ID uh, to take as uh, we have dreaded the complications from previously available drugs. Uh, however, uh, not all news is good because there continues to be a significant risk of relapse after, after, even after completion, completion of maria therapy. Uh, and finally, there's some additional research about potential use of off-the-shelf T-cell-specific products for CMB um, as an adjunct to therapy. Uh, however, it is more in the research down, uh, realm for now. Uh, CMB resistance is very difficult to manage, as we've discussed, because of the previously available drugs, uh, Foscarnet and Sodafovir having very significant uh, uh, toxicity, specifically nephrotoxicity, that can be uh, quite limiting for our patients. Um, there are other agents uh, that... Um, have been uh, looked at, uh, so we're looking at adaptive T-cell therapy uh, in the research studies, but also Latermavir that I've uh, mentioned has recently been approved for the high-risk kidney transplant population. Um, for prophylaxis, uh, has been used in low viremic cases for treatment, uh, but again, this is uh, early in uh, the days of use, utilizing that, and there's still some concern about uh, fairly low barrier um, uh, to resistance development for this drug. So addition, uh, there's ongoing clinical questions that remain at this time. Uh, what are the thresholds where we have to act upon a positive result? Um, is, should the thresholds be different for those who are high or low risk? And uh, are, the, are those the same amongst the different transplant centers? Right now, they're kind of uh, developed by each transplant center on their own. And what to do with the CMV T cell specific studies to try to evaluate the risk exactly? When we can use those? Um, is it at the completion of prophylaxis or at a different time point. So that uh, summarizes the CMV um, uh, part, and we'll move on to EBV. Uh, so similarly, uh, as I've mentioned, EBV monitoring practices really focus on our side to identify those who are at risk for PTLD complications, so post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, and we've discussed that the first 12 months um, is really the highest risk period, with the mismatch population being uh, the higher risk population as opposed to um, the recipient positive or donor and recipient negative uh, uh, patients. So the, from here, uh, what we, re we recognize that the mismatch uh, population is higher risk. So we review with the transplant teams if there's any uh, potential to minimize the level of immunosuppression from day one uh, post-transplant. Uh, antiviral prophylaxis specifically for EBV is not something that we currently utilize, uh, but rather a preemptive uh, monitoring strategy. EBV uh, viremia can occur without any symptoms, uh, therefore we uh, do preemptive monitoring, and typically once a month for the first year uh, is what's done at Mayo with uh, every three months for the second year. Those who have a positive result will, will have weekly follow-up tests a review of their immunosuppression, and specifically evalu uh, evaluation whether this is just viremia or PTLD is a concern. As noted, EBV viremia may or may not have any symptoms, therefore uh, the monitoring is uh, done regardless of symptoms. Uh, however, how to approach a positive result is still not entirely clear in the solid organ transplant side. Um, some have uh, advocated for uh, first uh, reduction in immunosuppression when viremia is noted uh, and there's no active PTLD. Typically, uh, we are not able um, to distingu distinguish uh, by symptoms alone. Therefore, additional imaging such as uh, CT scans, PET scans may be necessary to review for any lymphadenopathy or other evidence of disease. This is an example of a thoracic organ transplant with uh, PTLD, and the only modification was a change in their overall immunosuppression. We can see uh, lots of activity on the left side with improvement uh, just a couple months into decreased immunosuppression strategy. So that on its own can be uh, effective for PTLD uh, that's EBV-driven. And the last viral uh, agent is BK. So their options for BK monitoring would be on urine, plasma, 
Uh, and again, this is something that is only performed routinely in the kidney transplant recipients. In other transplant recipients, the implications of detecting this would be um, unclear, therefore routine monitoring is not recommended. Um, so how we monitor for BK in the kidney transplant population, uh, because uh, the plasma is more uh, predictive of potential transition from viremia to uh, nephropathy, this is what we monitor rather than uh, you looking at urine testing. Um, this is typically monitored um, much more so in the first year, and there are a couple different recommendations out there for how this is done. Uh, here at Mayo, we do month one, two, three, four, six, eight, and 12. Um, ASD, American uh, Society of Transplantation Guidelines, recommend monthly until nine months, then every three months for two years, and then uh, kidney disease improving global outcome is also monthly for the first three to six months, and then every three months. So a little bit of difference in how this uh, will be uh, done. Uh, reactivation is common, so a single positive test may not mean much. It's really trending. Uh, however, if uh, at the time reactivation is noted and there's an ele uh, elevation in creatinine or concern for renal dysfunction, uh, consideration whether uh, polyoma virus associated nephropathy is present uh, is needed. Manage, management uh, or monitoring beyond the plasma, we've discussed, although BK can be noted in the urine, and this is likely where it first will arise, uh, a positive test there may not have the same implications, and so we do not routinely monitor that. It is too, very sensitive, however, not specific enough at this time for uh, uh, routinely use it, utilizing that when plasma testing is available. Management of BK viremia uh, is really uh, focusing on the immunosuppressive state. Uh, there are a variety of approaches one can take, uh, but uh, it, resolve, it revolves around decreasing immunosuppression, first with anti-metabolite, and then uh, uh, further immunosuppression if there's no improvement in the viral load testing. Pathology is uh, obtained with a kidney biopsy if there's a question about the etiology of renal dysfunction, such as whether it's because of the viral infection or there could be a different process going on at the same time. And additional therapies uh, that uh, can be considered uh, similar to the other viral uh, inf uh, infections after a transplant uh, is virus-specific T cells. This is still in the research uh, phase. and. Uh, Perhaps we will know more about utility of uh, such therapy in the future, but not yet routinely done. Um, and this will summarize the three uh, viral uh, infection management and presentation after transplantation from our site. Appreciate your uh, attention. Dr. Bean, thank you very much for that presentation. I think you will all agree in the amongst the participants today we've had a great clinic in post-transplant viral infections and the challenges of clinical management. I apologize that we're gonna run over, but only by about five minutes. And uh, so I'm gonna assure you that we will uh, post all these slides and audio at captodayonline.com in about a week. We'll take out the interruptions that the technical problems caused us. And we will also share all of the questions and comments that we've had uh, with not only with Roche, but with our two distinguished speakers. And you may find that you get a more personal reply to a question or comment. Let us know if you have other questions or comments and we'll pass them along or try to have them answered in CAP today's question and answer uh, section, which is of course enormously popular. I'm going to uh, really settle on only one or two questions, and the first is for Dr. Yao. Could you please comment on the utility and interpretation of whole blood versus plasma when testing for e EBV viral load? Is there a reason for labs to validate both specimen types based on the presentation? Yes, that's a good question. <clears throat> There's actually quite a lot of studies uh, looking at the two different blood compartments, whole blood versus plasma for CMV, <clears throat> not as much for EBV. We do know from CMV um, that whole blood uh, contains higher viral load than testing plasma. Um, by various studies can be as high as one to two logs higher in whole blood. And that's explainable because 
of some of the viruses are present in peripheral blood mononuclear cells, PBMCs, are in, in addition to being present in plasma. So whole blood will definitely uh, contain more uh, viral particles or viral sequences. And this is similar to EBV as well. Um, now we do know from CMV that <clears throat> the uh, viremia uh, detected by whole blood testing uh, actually does not uh, have better prediction of recurrence of CMV uh, infection compared to plasma. Uh, so this was done very well by <clears throat> a multi-centered trial um, coordinated by Dr. Humar, uh, transplant specialist at Toronto General Hospital in Toronto, Canada. So uh, there are still uh, people who have a very uh, personal attachment to testing uh, whole blood. I believe our European colleagues in transplant infectious disease or transplantation um, in Europe uh, love to test whole blood compared to plasma. But in the U.S., okay. we're pretty well standardized to testing plasma. EBV, I think the same can be said um, okay. <clears throat> for what I mentioned for CMV, but less study available. Thank you, Dr. Yao. And for Dr. Beam, our final question, uh, you mentioned in your presentation, Dr. Beam, uh, CMV resistance and that how that can be hard to manage. How does one recognize CMV resistance? Yes, excellent question. It can be a, a discussion on its own. But essentially, if there is no response to what is adequate therapy with our primary drug, on uh, CMV monitoring by week two, or there's an increase in the viral load by week two, um, we would send off for resistance testing, which um, is uh, automated sequencing method specifically looking for uh, common mutations that are associated with resistance to the, dr the drug the patient's receiving. It also then give us information uh, whether there's additional mutation in the uh, present that may be associated with cross resistance to other antiviral drugs and help us decide on the best substitution uh, at that time, which can be one of the drugs I mentioned, Foscarnet, Sodafivir, or Marivivir, depending on the resistance uh, testing information and uh, what mutations are available from that result. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that, I'm going to give you the last word as I begin to wrap up on a very lively, stimulating presentation today. I want to first thank uh, Dr. Uh, Amit Parulakar from Roche, who gave a very good introduction to Roche's uh, stellar line of IVD assays to be used in these conditions. Obviously, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Beam and Dr. Yao. Uh, they've teamed up to give you a perfect clinical and diagnostic overview of this important topic. I think it's fair to say we all know uh, transplantation uh, volumes are rising and uh, will continue to rise. It's a very big part of the service line of multiple institutions now, from which many of you uh, know and you're working at them already. Finally, I want to thank Roche for their support and their sponsorship of today's important webinar. And uh, as I do that, I have one final thanks to do. And that is to all of you who've taken time out of a very busy schedule, I'm sure, to join us for this important webinar. We thank you for that. We're very grateful for your attendance. We'd love to hear from you what your thoughts are about this and other webinars that we do. But with that, I will bring